happy to welcome you to the bucket class this morning when we will resume our very interesting um, course of uh, talk by Mike Latham, who is vice president at Grinnell College, and he is continuing to speak to us on the wider history of the Vietnam War. Welcome back. Thanks, Joanna. It's uh, great to be with you all. Thank you. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Okay, terrific. Um, you know, our first session, we spent uh, some time talking about the impact of French imperialism on, on Southeast Asia and Vietnam in particular. Uh, then we talked about the rise of Vietnamese nationalism and radicalism. And today we're going to pivot and talk about the impact of the global Cold War. Uh, as you remember, we concluded uh, our presentation last time by talking about Vietnamese, the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence in 1945. And you remember I described how Ho Chi Minh had gone to the center of Hanoi in 1945 and had declared the independence of Vietnam uh, using the words of Thomas Jefferson and had done so with a group of American OSS officers standing by. Uh, and then had proceeded to seek American assistance to support the revolution. And so there was this sort of moment of tremendous historical irony uh, where, where Ho Chi Minh was actually taking this, this very uh, remarkable step. As you might imagine, the French were deeply opposed to the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence. Uh, they badly wanted to find an alternative to Ho Chi Minh. Uh, and one of the things they tried to do was to find a way to keep their colonies and do so by conferring only a nominal degree of autonomy to the Vietnamese revolutionaries. They wanted to find some sort of a compromise whereby they would give Vietnam some degree of domestic authority but still retain control over the Vietnamese foreign affairs, the Vietnamese army, external economic policy, and to some degree, internal economic policy as well. That was certainly not what Ho Chi Minh wanted to see. And warfare escalated as the negotiations between France and the Vietnamese revolutionaries failed. And the French discovered that they were now facing a tough and battle-hardened enemy, uh, a very well-organized enemy that would settle for nothing less than full independence. The United States ultimately decided that they would back the French in their fight against the Viet Minh. And today I'd like to go into uh, explaining a, a deeper uh, picture, a framework through which the United States sought to respond to these questions. And there are a few key questions which I'd like to go ahead and put forward now as we begin to think about why it is that the United States takes steps toward fighting against the Vietnamese Revolution. The first question is this, how did American policymakers understand the stakes in Vietnam? Through what lens or, or conceptual framework did they try to understand the situation there? So that's the first question, how did they understand the stakes in Vietnam? The second question is, did any U.S. policymakers dissent or reject the idea of backing the U.S. empire? Even as the pressure to engage grew, were there some who argued against it, who warned that this was not a good idea, that this was not a path the U.S. should go down? And then finally, what were the political consequences of the Viet Minh victory over the French? And why did the United States ultimately make Vietnam its own war to fight? Why did the United States choose to go to war in Vietnam? Because in a very real way, it was a choice. Uh, and it was a choice that was made in the early 1950s. And so I really want to try to frame that today. To understand these questions and to begin to get into this, we need to get a better sense of what was happening geopolitically at the outset of the Cold War. And 1946 and 1947 were really crucial years for the shaping of American policy toward the rest of the world. Uh, the U.S. experienced some significant setbacks, uh, some uh, challenges to its expectations of what the post-war world would be like, uh, and ultimately turned toward a vision of containment as an answer uh, to that situation. 
That was not the only choice, but it was, in many respects, one that Americans found quite compelling. To understand this, we have to get a sense of what these post-war setbacks were. Harry Truman expected that American economic superiority globally and America's nuclear monopoly at the end of World War II would allow it to have a great deal of influence over Soviet conduct. Europe had been devastated by the war. The United States had emerged in the ashes of World War II as the only truly global superpower. At this point, with a great deal of economic power, with a nuclear monopoly, there was a hope on the part of people like Truman and his key advisors that they could lead Stalin to ultimately live up to the terms of the Yalta Agreement. And so at the close of World War II, in 1945, there's a very famous and important conference happened at Yalta in which Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin met together, the Allied leaders about to win the Second World War. And they worked out a series of agreements uh, around spheres of authority and, and recognition. And one of the key components of these agreements was that the Soviets would ultimately allow self-determination for the countries alongside their borders. But the Soviets were not going to do that. And ultimately, uh, a pattern began to emerge in which Soviet actions, taken out of a desire to preserve their security in the aftermath of World War II, were perceived by the United States as the beginning of a determined pattern of aggression. The American death toll in World War II was about 400,000. There were very few civilian deaths. Nearly all of those deaths were military. So the Americans lost about 400,000 sailors, soldiers, Marines, others during the course of World War II. The Soviet death toll in World War II is still in dispute, but they lost on the order of 11 million soldiers and another 10 to 15 million civilians. So the Soviet death toll was somewhere on the order of 20 to 25 million people. The US death toll again was 400,000. The war was fought on a very long front against Germany, as soon as Germany invaded the Soviet Union. This war was fought on a very long front that stretched from the Black Sea all the way to the Baltic. Uh, the equivalent distance in the United States would be about from Baltimore to Cheyenne, Wyoming. So the devastating cost of the war fought along this very long front against the Nazis had ultimately inflicted this tremendous death toll on the Soviet Union. Stalin and the Soviet leadership were determined that they could never again suffer an invasion of that magnitude or that scale. That Soviet security required full control of the states along its eastern borders. And so Stalin violated ultimately violated the Yalta Accords, which he had agreed to with um, FDR and Churchill in the spring of 1945, and began a crackdown, a Soviet-supported crackdown across Eastern Europe. In country after country, they led communist movements which took control and ultimately used force to install brutal and dictatorial regimes. Again, what the Americans perceived happening here was interpreted as the beginning of a step toward continual expansion. The Americans looked at this and expected that the Soviets were bent on a campaign of global expansion wherever they could pursue it. Stalin and others may have had such ambitions eventually, but their primary concern was Soviet security, establishing and safeguarding the Soviet state. To make matters worse, Stalin then rejected the open door the idea of an open door for trade, for commerce, for ideas, which was part of the Bretton Woods agreements following World War II. Those were the agreements which established the norms for international economic trade. Stalin rejected those, would not be a part of them. And then finally, the United States and the Soviets were unable to arrive at an international atomic energy agreement. The Soviets rejected the provision that the United States would control each step of atomic energy development down to inspections. And Americans found themselves facing a set of diplomatic reversals 
which led to a number of searching questions about the intentions of the Soviet regime. There was a moment at the end of World War II of tremendous optimism, a hope that perhaps there would be some sort of long-term possibility of a successful agreement with the Soviets, and that fell apart fairly quickly. Americans also expected, and Truman expected, that the monopoly on nuclear weapons that the United States possessed in 1945 would last a decade or more. They thought that, that perhaps this would be something which would continue. In fact, uh, in 1945, at the Potsdam Conference, as the war was drawing to a close, um, uh, Truman came to uh, the conference. It was one of the first international conferences he attended as president following FDR's sudden death, when Truman had moved into the White House. And he came to the conference and he said to Stalin, he said, you know, you, you need to understand that we have produced a weapon of tremendous destructive power. We have, we have produced a weapon that, that is nothing like any seen before, uh, and, and we have this in development, and, and we, are, you know, we are going to be able to use it soon. And, and Stalin basically shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I hope you use it against the Japanese. Um, and, and part of the reason that Stalin seemed so totally unperturbed and just sort of un, unsurprised was that he already knew all about the bomb. The Soviets had penetrated the Manhattan Project through espionage. In fact, Stalin may have known more about the bomb than Truman did at that point. Um, because they had so thoroughly penetrated the project and were aware of its development. Um, in 1949, using some of the information that they had acquired through spying, the Soviets detonated their own weapon, their own atomic bomb. So the, the nuclear monopoly lasted only four years. And at that point, a flying, ar a flying arms race was underway, uh, an arms race which would continue to accelerate and grow as the Cold War continued. So Truman, looking at this situation, increasingly concerned about Soviet behavior, began to embrace the idea of containment uh, as a solution. And the concept of containment itself was one that was authored by George Kennan who was a famous defense intellectual. Uh, George Kennan was, in fact, the uh, director of the State Department's Policy Planning Council. And Kennan, who was long a, st a scholar, a, a very serious scholar of Soviet history, and Russian history, had suggested that if the United States were able to meet Soviet aggression at key points, that the Soviets would back down, that they were opportunists that if the United States met them directly at key points, that ultimately they would back down, and even eventually, Kennan theorized, that the Soviet system would be unstable and would collapse under its own weight. Well, that turned out to be correct. Um, but he anticipated that this was going to happen, and he, but the key point for Kennan was that Europe was the key theater. Europe was the key place. This was where the stakes were highest. <coughs> Kennan himself was not a person who believed that the Cold War needed to be global in nature. In fact, there were some parts of the world Kennan would, would write, sometimes derisively, very critically, which just really didn't matter that much, he said. There were some parts of the world you just shouldn't worry about. Strategically, they're not that significant. Interestingly enough, Kennan would become one of the primary critics of the American War in Vietnam. By 1966, he would be testifying before the United States Congress in opposition to the war. But at this point, in many respects, the argument that Kennan was making was one that Truman and others took and radically expanded. And they expanded in ways that Kennan himself would not have anticipated or recognized. Truman did begin to think about containment as a global imperative, as did most of his policymakers and he began to make it a component of general national policy. And that chain of events began in February of 1947. The British warned Truman and his advisors that their government was facing bankruptcy, that they would not be able to try to contain revolutionary movements which were now growing in the Mediterranean, in Greece, and in Turkey. Both of those governments were under pressure from communist forces. And the British turned and basically said to the United States, if you're going to stop this, it's, it's really up to you. You can't carry this burden. Truman defined the crisis as one demanding immediate action and a strong US commitment. He went to Congress first, and then publicly 
he held a famous speech in March of 1947. And you can see him delivering the speech here in the, the slide in the lower half of the image here. Uh, and this is the speech in the statement which ultimately, ultimately became known as the Truman Doctrine. And there were a couple of key points that Truman made in this speech in February of 1947. The first was he introduced the concept of infection. And he began to use a rhetoric talking about the concept of infection and thinking about the fight against communism. Communism, he said, was like a disease. If the United States did not respond, if the United States did not respond to it, ultimately, as he put it in his words, like apples in a barrel infected one by a rotten one, the corruption of Greece would infect Iran and all the countries to the east. In other words, the dangers that would grow for not only Greece or Turkey, but for all of the countries which were immediately proximate to it. Um, so Truman, perhaps coming from Missouri, being familiar with agriculture, thought about apples, rotten apples, infecting each other. But the concept would ultimately be used later, and instead of apples, we would start talking about dominoes. The idea that if you did not take a stand in one case, that ultimately this would create a kind of chain reaction whereby all of the others would also fall. Each case, in other words, would be linked to the others. Rather than focusing on a particular situation and evaluating it in terms of its own strategic significance, the United States policy began to make a shift to say that no, really, a crisis anywhere was a crisis everywhere because the world was totally seamless. If you did not take a stand everywhere, you would lose credibility. You would lose the confidence of your allies. You would embolden the opportunistic Soviets. You would ultimately say to the world that you are not ready to take a stand against this. And you would ultimately worsen your strategic position. Again, this was quite different than what people like George Kennan had argued earlier. They had said, look, some parts of the world are crucial. Europe happens to be like that, given the way the major industrial economies are, given what's happening there. Um, other parts of the world are not as vital. Not as essential. But ultimately what had happened here by March of 1947 was that Truman and his, his advisors were now spinning this in a very different direction. So that was the first concept. This idea of infection or the ultimate sense of linkage between one case and another. The second key component that Truman made there in speaking before Congress in March of 1947 was the idea of polarization, dividing the world in two. And his words, I think, are quite powerful. He put it this way. He said, at the present moment in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. One way of life is based upon the will of the majority and is distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, freedom of speech and religion, and freedom from political oppression. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies upon terror and oppression, a controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. What Truman was doing, in very stark language, was defining a world in which there was no middle ground. Every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. There was no space here for a nationalist revolution. As he was framing it, there was only liberal democracy or communist totalitarianism. There was no space here for a country or a state to pursue some sort of independent or non-aligned path. The world, in fact, in his vision, was being cast in, in very stark terms. So this ideal of a seamless world, the sense that a crisis anywhere was a crisis everywhere, that a failure to act in any location would damage American credibility globally, would begin the chain of dominoes, was now firmly taking hold in the way that Americans thought about and interpreted the world. What this meant then, and I think this is a crucial point, what this meant was that the specifics of a given region's history or culture were cast to the side. 
The idea that you would carefully analyze and think about in independent terms a specific case became harder and harder to do because the framework which was being used was so starkly and globally defined. What this then, I think, began to open was the possibility of an open-ended commitment to oppose what you believed would be an ideology wherever it might occur. And I think this is the framework then in which the United States began to make a commitment to go to war in Vietnam. American advisors, interestingly enough, were divided on this question. The Asia specialists in the State Department noted that French proposals didn't have much traction in Vietnam. They had very little popular support. The Asia specialists pointed out that Ho Chi Minh's nationalist strength and reputation made him the most popular and influential leader in the country. George Abbott, who was serving as the U.S. Consul in Saigon, reported back to Washington in 1948, arguing that the United States should withhold its support from the French until they did much more to satisfy nationalist ambitions. He called for caution. He pointed out that if the United States held back its recognition of the French regime, then it would be, to some extent, in a much better position, because they could still act if the French failed. But the U.S. would not be on record in support of repression by the French. He expressed his concern regarding what he called, and these are his words, the lack of comprehension by the French public of the depth and strength of nationalism in colonial areas, areas which has emerged in the post-war world. The European specialists in the State Department, however, made a very different argument. T. Jefferson Caffrey, who was the U.S. ambassador to France, argued that the French-backed government was the only alternative to Ho Chi Minh, who was clearly an unacceptable communist. The political balance in France, he said, was so delicate and the dangers of left-wing organizing were so strong that if the United States did not support the conservative government in France, they would run the risk of destabilizing that crucial country, a country which the United States would need as a post-war ally as the U.S. would begin to move toward the reconstruction of Europe and the Marshall Plan. Communist victory in China in 1949, as the Chinese Revolution succeeded, ultimately threw much more weight on the side of the French. The National Security Council warned that Mao's success was a major blow to American goals in Asia, and they became quite worried that this would be the beginning of a wider pattern. Those fears were confirmed in January of 1950, when both China and the Soviet Union recognized diplomatically recognized Ho Chi Minh's government in Vietnam. At that point, the United States decided to formally recognize the French-led regime. And they did so by ultimately recognizing officially uh, Bao Dai, who was actually the heir to the former imperial throne in Vietnam. So the French had actually gone back and they had found the surviving heirs of the old imperial family, the one that they themselves, they themselves had subverted back in the 19th century. And they found the surviving heir who was living in France and in Hong Kong, um, a person who had spent almost none of his entire life in Vietnam. Uh, and they brought him back and they said, you know, this is, we're ultimately going to try to broker an agreement using Bao Dai, the heir to the imperial throne, and he'll be our representative domestically in Vietnam, and the U.S. chose to, to recognize that government. So the highest American officials were increasingly seeing the world through a Cold War lens. They rejected the advice of officials on the ground in Southeast Asia, State Department officers on the ground who warned that the French had no legitimacy. Um, they rejected those who might have been able to think about and see Vietnam in its own terms, looking at its own history and its own, its own culture. <coughs> The U.S. also began a pattern of American political and economic support. On May 1st of 1950, $10 million of U.S. military aid flowed to the French government to help them fight the Vietnamese Revolution. And that was the start of a much longer and much more extensive commitment. Now, there were brief flashes of dissent. There were moments where policymakers and public figures did step outside the containment argument. And they began to open up other kinds of questions. One of them was the newspaper columnist Walter Littman, uh, 
very famous writer, very influential writer on US policy and foreign affairs, who was really quite skeptical about how American aid was going to supposedly turn back uh, communism in Southeast Asia. This, he said, was equivalent to an offer to sell the Brooklyn Bridge to widows and orphans for a down payment of $2.75. <laughs> The State Department Asia specialists were also continually worried. They warned that the United States was backing a very weak horse. That this was not really who you wanted to throw yourself in with. That, that this government, this approach, was simply not going to succeed. One of them, a guy named Charlton Ogburn in the State Department, expressed his views quite forcefully. He said, this shabby business probably represents an improvement over the brutal colonialism of earlier years, but it's now too late in the history of the world to settle for the price of this cheap substitute. Faced with a dilemma like this, the best possible course is to wait for the breaks. Certainly we should not play our cards in such a way that we are allied with reaction. Whether the French like it or not, independent, independence is coming to Indochina. Why, therefore, do we tie ourselves to the tail of their battered kite? Auburn and others like him were not comfortable with Ho Chi Minh. But they expected that because of Vietnam's historic antipathy toward China, and their hope that Ho Chi Minh might be willing to have an internationally neutral Vietnam, that it was worth trying to negotiate and discuss what might be possible. It was certainly better, they believed, to wait and see what would happen than to dive in alongside France to ally yourself with colonialism and to ultimately move toward an open-ended commitment. A senior Defense Department official named John Oley made another case. He was worried about the degree to which the war in Vietnam would begin to draw the United <coughs> States into a very poorly defined situation with infinitely receding objectives. In 1950, Oli wrote that since 1945, the French had suffered over 50,000 troops wounded or killed in the war to try to defeat the Vietnamese Revolution. What would it take to try to win there, if that was the case? As he put it, we are gradually increasing our stake in the outcome of the struggle and we are dangerously close to the point of being so deeply committed that we may find ourselves completely committed even to direct intervention. These situations, unfortunately, have a way of snowballing. And he was right, of course. Uh, things did soon snowball. And dissent like that became increasingly uncommon. And so as the Cold War accelerated, the space for dissent, the space for disagreement began to quickly diminish as the United States moved toward the situation. So now the United States faced some very serious dilemmas by about 1950. Questions that should have given policymakers serious pause. Number one, how to appease the French and promote Vietnamese independence at the same time? Could, could you do that? Was, that? was that even possible? Those goals seemed irreconcilable, because after all, French imperialism was really fueling the revolution. If you aligned yourself with the French and came in militarily, weren't you only pushing the Vietnamese revolution in increasingly radical directions? Were you, in fact, making a situation you were already worried about worse? Second, if the French failed, to what extent was the United States going to be willing to take on the fight against the revolutionaries? Were there any limits to containment? Were there any lines you would not cross? If so, where were those lines? Third, how should you deal with the power of Vietnamese nationalism? Was it realistic to think that the United States could redirect it? That America could somehow succeed where the French had failed so miserably? But American policymakers wrestled with, and in some respects, I would argue, in 1950, failed to answer those questions, failed to think seriously about them, because they were quickly and immediately drawn into a vision of the Cold War in which the space for this kind of more searching debate became increasingly diminished. In June of 1950, the Korean War also began. 
Troops from Communist North Korea pushed across the frontier, driving south into South Korea, and the containment line sharpened as the United States sent its own military forces to join a UN contingent in that war. The losses were very heavy. Ultimately, 53,000 Americans would die fighting in Korea. Communist China also came directly into the conflict when UN forces approached its borders. And the war finally ended in a bloody stalemate along the 38th parallel, where it very close to where, in fact, it begun. The U.S. began its first commitment to Vietnam of $10 million in May of 1950. Between 1950 and 1954, the United States then poured $4 billion into Vietnam to try to help the French fight the Viet Minh at that point. So the room for dissent was rapidly disappearing. Americans came to believe that they had to hold the line in Vietnam, and that this had become a crucial case, a crucial test case for credibility. American aid, though, didn't make much difference in changing the fundamental political reality of the war. The French and their ally, their, their, the government they were trying to work through, the Emperor Bao Dai, had very little legitimacy. Ho Chi Minh, however, and the Viet Minh revolutionaries, the heirs of the struggle against not only the French, but also the Japanese during World War II, had a great deal of legitimacy on the ground. Ho Chi Minh and Vo Nguyen Yap began to expand the guerrilla campaign in the north. They offered assistance to local villagers. They drafted some of them as well. They began to solidify and build an army. Between 1949 and 1950, Ziap was able to triple the number of soldiers under revolutionary command. They totaled about 300,000 men at that point. They began to receive equipment and arms as well across the border from China, especially following Chinese recognition of the revolutionary government in 1950. That wasn't, in fact, as much, they didn't receive as much in the way of supplies and equipment as the French did from the United States, but it was important and valuable assistance. The war also went terribly badly for the French. By the end of 1952, the French had lost 90,000 soldiers. Public support for the war began to fall among a population in France that was still recovering from the trauma and devastation of World War II. You can imagine, of course, so much of the war being fought across French territory. Uh, and now the French public plunged back into war, this time in Southeast Asia, and taking these kinds of losses. The cost began to soar in terms of lives and in resources. And, and an attempt began then to work toward a negotiated peace, and talks started in the city of Geneva. The French government was searching for a way to extricate itself from the war, without what they hoped would be a total defeat. Ho Chi Minh, for his part, began to hope for some kind of a settlement that would leave the revolutionaries in position to continue their struggle for independence. Interestingly enough, the Soviets and the Chinese were also demanding that Ho Chi Minh go to the negotiating table. Neither the Soviets nor the Chinese were very interested in a wider war at this point. And as documents have been released following the end of the Cold War, as we've received more documents out of uh, what were formerly Soviet archives, as we've received better information out of, out of Chinese sources as well, it became quite clear that at this point in 1950, 1952, uh, the Soviets were hoping for better relations with the West. That China, having suffered greatly in the Korean War when it chose to intervene, was not interested in another American military intervention immediately along its borders. Having just gone to war in Korea, China was not eager to plunge into war in Vietnam. This actually was not really what Ho Chi Minh had wanted to hear. So his principal allies were saying to him, you go to the negotiating table, and you're probably not going to get everything you want. You're probably not going to get a guarantee of full independence across the entire country. But we want you to seek a negotiated settlement that will at least end the war, so we don't have to come in, thank you very much, uh, and will in fact create a situation where eventually you'll be able to succeed. 
And that really wasn't what Ho Chi Minh wanted. If Ho Chi Minh was going to negotiate at this point, he wanted full independence. That was his commitment. But his primary backers, the Soviets and the Chinese, were saying, no, you're going to go to Geneva and you're going to have ultimately a negotiation that even if it only gets you half a loaf, that's what you're going to sell for. The Viet Minh, of course, had fought a brutal war for seven years at that point, and now his allies were telling him to seek a solution that could result most likely only in partial control of the country. But that was what he was going to do. The French, however, still hoped to gain a military victory that would decisively shape the playing field for diplomacy. And they wanted to draw the Viet Minh into a set-piece battle. If only the Vietnamese would stand up and fight us directly. If only they would come out and we would have a set-piece battle, we would bring to bear our superior military force and we would obliterate them. And so they decided they would try to draw the Viet Minh into a set-piece battle in the far northwestern part of the country near the border of Laos. They placed a large garrison in the village of Dien Bien Phu, stationing about 16,000 soldiers there. And they basically dared the Viet Minh to engage them militarily. And they ultimately placed this garrison in an open plain surrounded by high hills on all sides and built a ring of French artillery fire bases around it to defend it. Their plan was to resupply the French position by air, so they built an airstrip near the garrison. And although this was a very remote area and resupplying this was going to be really difficult, their thinking was that since the Viet Minh had no air force, and since they had no anti-aircraft capability, um, that there was really no chance that this would be a problem. When they looked at the high mountains surrounding uh, the garrison, and in fact in the slide here you can see some of those mountains surrounding the garrison, they said, you know, there is no way that they're ever going to get artillery up there. There's no way that they're ever going to be a real threat. They don't have an air force. They don't have anti-aircraft capability. They can't get artillery up there. Well, they seriously underestimated what the Viet Minh were capable of doing. They brought in heavy artillery, including anti-aircraft weapons. They hauled them up steep mountain slopes, so they disassembled them at the bottom, carried them up, and then rebuilt them at the top. They put them into a very well-reinforced and heavily camouflaged positions, and then they pointed them straight down at the French position. In March of 1954, the Viet Minh opened a massive artillery bombardment. They destroyed the airstrip almost immediately, which prevented resupply of the French garrison. French warfare then began on the ground. Warfare looked kind of like what you saw in World War I, as the Viet Minh began to dig trenches and steadily move closer and closer to the French point. The Viet Minh positions, moreover, being so heavily camouflaged and well-placed in the mountains, were either out of range or very difficult for the French to reach. In fact, when the French artillery commander realized this, he saw the handwriting on the wall and actually committed suicide. The classic book on this battle is called Hell in a Very Small Place. And I think it reflects what the French garrison would go through over the next few months. Ultimately, as the French succeeded, I'm sorry, ultimately as, as the Vietnamese, as the Viet Minh succeeded in destroying the airstrip, they began to continually shell the garrison and then move toward a ground assault, uh, which was ultimately successful. And the French suffered very heavy losses. Uh, this, the Viet Minh brought to bear a force of about 50,000 soldiers, uh, striking this uh, French garrison held by about 16,000. In May of 1954, the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, the last great battle of the French part of the war. Eisenhower, President Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles, his Secretary of State, were deeply concerned about this. They actually sent a number of requests to Congress for the authority to use U.S. force to defend the French. They launched some bombing raids. Uh, they considered back up. They considered bombing raids. In fact, there was actually at one point consideration of a nuclear strike. Um, uh, interestingly enough, it was a senator from Texas by the name of Lyndon B. Johnson who led the opposition to American intervention to try to support the French, uh, warning that unless the British came back in, uh, 
that the U.S. would be acting without allies and alone. And Churchill was way too smart to back this dead horse, to, to go back into this situation and reject an intervention. So the Vietnamese prevailed. And this ultimately led to the situation that emerged with a, a political settlement and, and the Geneva Conference in, in 1954. So I see we're hitting the, it's about 1040, so we'll take a, a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll come back. I'm gonna outline what happened at the Geneva Conference and then try to give you an idea of, of why the United States then chose to intervene and engage in the war as it did. So we'll go ahead and pause there for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you for taking your seats. Before we get started again, uh, I realized I was remiss at the beginning and I forgot to remind you to turn off your cell phones so and turn on the T-coil and so please do that now if you forgot before. Thank you. Mike, it's all yours. Okay, so let, let's get a sense of what happened then at, at Geneva in 1954 at this, at this important international conference. Interestingly enough, the, the conference to address the war and to try to arrive at some settlement opened only two days after the French had lost at Dien Bien Phu. So, so this was emerging, this was happening right in the wake of, of, of that crisis. And in fact, you can see on, on this map here, Dien Bien Phu is that little X up there, right in the far northwest of the country next to the border of Laos. Um, so out of the discussions at Geneva, um, which, which the French attended um, actually uh, against the wishes of the United States, um, there were three main agreements that came out of it. There were three main agreements that came out of the Geneva Accords. The first was that there would be a ceasefire along a temporary division of military zones at the 17th parallel. So there was going to be a ceasefire at the 17th parallel, right here, along a temporary division of military zones. And the word temporary is really important. This was not, and the agreement was very explicit, this was not to be seen as a political or territorial boundary. This was a ceasefire line, recognizing that Viet Minh authority was greater in the north, uh, French-backed Vietnamese forces would be moving south of the line, but the line was not supposed to be seen as a political or territorial boundary. That was the first point. Second, neither party, neither the French-backed uh, forces in the south of the country, nor the revolutionaries who were now moving toward the north, were to join a military allowance, uh, alliance, excuse me, or to allow foreign bases to be placed. <clears throat> Third, by September of 1956, there were to be general elections to create a unified Vietnam. So those are the three key provisions. A ceasefire dividing the country along a temporary line. Neither side was to join a military alliance and there were supposed to be elections to unify the country, democratic elections, in September of 1956. The United States did not sign the accords. Uh, Secretary of State Dulles, however, did issue a separate statement recognizing them and promising not to violate them by threat of force or use of force. Ho Chi Minh was disappointed with what happened at Geneva. He had hoped that an agreement would actually reflect battlefield positions zones of authority on the ground, which would have put him at a major advantage. However, when the Soviets and the Chinese said, that's what you're going to settle for, be patient, we don't want to get into a wider war here, settle for this, uh, he did so. He took heart in the fact that the Viet Minh had a better organizational structure, that Ho Chi Minh himself was the most popular political figure in the country, and an expectation that that edge and the shift from a military battle to a political one would ultimately end in success for the revolutionaries. However, as we know, those elections were never held. The military struggle did not end. And American strategic planners took a number of steps to ignore the Geneva Accords, to encourage South Vietnamese leaders to refuse to engage in the elections, 
and to make the 17th parallel a permanent boundary. U.S. officers and policymakers knew that Ho Chi Minh would have won the election in 1956, and they were determined not to allow that to happen. The reasons why the United States took that course and what began to unfold are, are, are fascinating and, and, and troubling. The American Cold War framework now ran directly counter to the nationalist cause, the revolutionary cause, uh, in Vietnam. With the French gone, the war was now America's to fight, and there were still no answers to those fundamental questions which I raised a few moments ago. This marked then the beginning of an American attempt to create an entirely new government with an entirely new national identity in a distinctly South Vietnamese part of the country. It started the beginning of a quest, an ultimately futile quest, to create a viable government that would achieve sufficient political legitimacy to undermine the revolution. It began, it really was the, mark, the start of the American attempt to invent South Vietnam as a country and to create a government and a state which ultimately would have sufficient legitimacy that Vietnamese would be willing to support it, to die for it, in opposition to the revolution. Americans dreamed to some extent of what some began to call a third force, free from either colonialism or communism. And they began to imagine that they might be able to direct the course of Vietnamese nationalism in South Vietnam. The leader of the New Republic of Vietnam was Ngo Di Diem, who had been appointed Prime Minister by Emperor Bao Dai in June of 1954, just prior to the Geneva Accords. Diem had been born in central Vietnam. He was part of a family that had converted to Catholicism in the 17th century. He had attended French Catholic schools. Eventually, he was uh, one of a, a very few Vietnamese to move toward a relatively high position in the, uh, in the government under the French, serving as a provincial governor by the time he was 25. But his anti-communist convictions were also very strong. He believed that it was averse to his religious faith, that a communist regime would be brutal if it came to power. So he was impatient with the French and opposed to the communists as well and in American eyes, this gave him a good deal of credibility. He demanded that the French give some real power to the Vietnamese legislature that they treated as a figurehead. The French countered in 1933 by stripping him of his position as Minister of the Interior and threatening to arrest him if he continued to press for a more independent course. During World War II, Xi'an actually tried to persuade the Japanese to declare Vietnam's independence to no avail. <coughs> And he was actually captured by the Viet Minh in September of 1945. He was exiled to an isolated highland village near the Chinese border where he caught malaria. And he learned that a Viet Minh group had also killed his older brother, an anti-communist who had served the French as a provincial governor. There was, in fact, a tense meeting between Xiem and Ho Chi Minh himself, at which there was an attempt to come to terms that broke up and failed. In 1950, Xiem finally, fearing for his life, traveled to Lakewood, New Jersey, where he, learned, he lived for two years in a Marinol seminary, spending two years uh, washing dishes, scrubbing the floors, and praying like any other novice. He also met with a core of future supporters, including Francis Cardinal Spellman, the Archbishop of New York, and the young Senator John F. Kennedy. Xiem's ambition was to go back to Vietnam in a position of power, to lead the nation in opposition to both France and the Vietnamese revolutionaries. And Geneva now appeared to give him the shot that he wanted. Americans were indecisive regarding his qualifications. They wondered if he had any appeal beyond the Catholic population of southern Vietnam. They were disturbed by his attempts to centralize control around his family. But they feared that if they failed to back him, that the communists would only gain and time would run out. One of the great problems was that Xi'an was most determined to centralize and safeguard his own personal control, and quite resistant to what he perceived as American interference. But convinced that there was no option, no other option, no better option, the U.S. quickly sent $300 million to Xi'an to support his new government. 
And this was the start of a long and futile quest by the United States to find a leader in South Vietnam that would be strong enough to stand on his own and appear legitimate, but also remain willing to take advice from the Americans in directing the fight for the survival of an artificial and hardly independent regime. Diem also proved to be no Democrat. He quickly consolidated dictatorial rule by banning the opposition, jailing his opponents, shutting down critical newspapers and radio, his secret police began to work with American consent and torture was a common practice. Ziem was determined to root out any Viet Minh sympathizers and cells in South Vietnam and was willing to take whatever action he thought would secure that goal. Suspects were often those denounced by jealous neighbors or corrupt officials who wanted their property. There was no regular legal process. Prisoners were tried by security committees headed by Ziem's province chiefs and appointed directly by himself. One journalist recalled the following view. He said, I myself watched an interrogation in a Mekong Delta town on a blistering hot day in the late 1950s. Soldiers had brought in a lean youth in black cotton pajamas who looked like any peasant. He squatted impassively as if stoically awaiting a fate he could not avoid. The soldiers wired his fingers to a field telephone and cranked it as an officer spoke with surprising gentleness to the youth, trying to extract information or a confession. The youth gritted his teeth, his facial muscles taut as the electricity coursed through his body, and he finally blurted out a few words, perhaps only to stop the ordeal. Summary imprisonments and executions were common under Ziem's rule. Eisenhower's advisors were troubled by this. They were worried about it. People like Henry Cabot Lodge, who you see here in the photograph, who was the U.S. ambassador to South Vietnam, sitting alongside Ziem, were deeply troubled by it. They recognized that this was not the Thomas Jefferson or the Abraham Lincoln of, of South Vietnam. <laughs> they recognized that, that Ziem was an increasingly brutal dictator, a difficult person to work with or to try to support and they recognized as well that his campaign of repression was increasingly deepening radical and revolutionary resistance to his government. And yet, they felt like they didn't have much choice. They felt like there weren't very many good alternatives. Sink or swim, the Pinozius Yem, was increasingly the, the perspective which began to take hold. And Ziem did have strong backers within the United States. As a, as a Catholic, as a person who seemed to represent a faith that Americans could understand and respect, he won a great deal of loyal support. He had strong backers among a number of American political figures in the U.S., including those within elements of both political parties. And this really marked the point at which the United States began to think about this possibility, this long-run goal of creating an independent South Vietnam which would somehow win the legitimacy of the population, militarily defeat the revolution, and forestall the further spread of revolution throughout Southeast Asia. Ziem's repression did weaken the Viet Minh infrastructure in the South. Over the course of, the, uh, over the course of his government, he ultimately wound up imprisoning about 800,000 uh, South Vietnamese and killed about 90,000 during the 1950s alone, while the United States stood by. It was also at this point that a new element of the revolution began to build as well. The revolutionaries were deeply worried by this trend. They were worried that as warfare continued in South Vietnam, that if it were to escalate, this might lead to even greater U.S. intervention not only military aid, but the possibility of the deployment of combat troops, something they really wished to avoid. They were worried as well that the United States might even strike against northern Vietnam too. And so party leaders, senior party leaders in North Vietnam, as they confronted the situation, tried to find a way to limit revolutionary action in the South. They hoped they could temper armed resistance even as Ziem's actions began to place revolutionaries under severe strain. 
But the pressure began to build through the late 1950s as villagers themselves began to act on their own against Xi'an's government, arming themselves with homemade shotguns, crossbows, other weapons, and fighting back against a government which was determined to root out any form of dissent. Finally, in late 1960, a group was formed called the National Liberation Front in South Vietnam. This was a collaboration of diverse groups and individuals who had been driven underground or into armed resistance by Xi'an's government. In many respects, one of the great ironies here is that Xi'an's brutal repression and the United States' support for it helped create the conditions which forged the National Liberation Front that pushed together a wide variety of social, political, and religious forces in South Vietnam into each other's arms. Many of them had little in common politically with each other, except for their common opposition to Xi'an and Xi'an's government. Xi'an quickly labeled them the Viet Cong, or the Vietnamese Communists. NLF cadres and political officers began to live with peasants in local areas that they were from. And Xi'an and American violence began to form the basis for additional recruiting. But the National Liberation Front's own invocation of ideals of a united Vietnam began to make larger and larger impacts. In some places, the NLF began to expropriate land to those who were loyal to the, South, to the Saigon government. They began to take land away from Xi'an supporters and other loyalists to the South Vietnamese regime and redistribute it among poorer peasants. They were quite willing to allow landlords that supported the NLF, however, to continue to collect reduced rents. So at this point, what the revolutionaries in South Vietnam were, were facing was a very difficult situation. Many of the senior political leaders in North Vietnam were quite worried about an escalated armed struggle in the South. They certainly were hoping to achieve the united independence of Vietnam, but they were worried about the extent to which former Viet Minh fighters who stayed in the South, who never went back to the North, and the NLF as it began to build, would ultimately raise the stakes of violence to the point where the United States would enter militarily. That was something they really wanted to avoid. And yet, as the repression began to build, as increasingly Southerners took matters into their own hands, fighting against Xi'an's government, an alliance began to build among many different sectors of the South Vietnamese population. Intellectuals, farmers, wage workers, a number of professional people. Others who were so deeply alienated by what Xi'an was doing found their common ground in opposition to that government and began to organize and arm themselves militarily. By the early 1960s, in many respects, the die was now starting to be cast for the rest of the war. The United States had chosen to try to defeat the revolution in the aftermath of World War II. They allied with the French. When the French failed militarily, when that war was lost, and the Geneva Accords came through, the United States looked at that settlement as an unacceptable one, as one that they could not tolerate. The idea of elections in 1956, they realized, would create a risk that they could not accept. And at that point, then, they decided to begin on the path to create a, a separate, independent, and somehow legitimate South Vietnam. Xi'an was the first person they began to work with to try to do that, but by no means would he be the last. In fact, what you begin to see from this point is the long series of American attempts to somehow find a South Vietnamese political figure and to create a South Vietnamese government which would have enough stability and legitimacy to actually stand on its own. An attempt here to ultimately divert or redirect the course of Vietnamese nationalism in a very different direction. And a hope that they would be able to find a means or a mechanism to do that. In many respects, this is one of the things I find most, most fascinating and, and really troubling about, about the war itself. Um, South Vietnam was a political creation. It was an invention. 
And it was an invention that the United States began to try to pursue in an attempt to redirect the course of Vietnamese history. The attempt to do that, and the attempt to create a government which would be able to stand and have legitimacy, I think is one of the things we often lose sight of. In a really fundamental way, war is a political activity. Um, Clausewitz, the famous German theorist, was absolutely right in this regard. War is a form of politics by other means. And the United States never could engineer the fundamental political solution which would have allowed a South Vietnamese government to stand on its own two feet and achieve sufficient legitimacy that Vietnamese would decide in very large numbers that they were really ready to stand and fight and die for that ideology. The inability to do that, the inability to redirect or somehow radically transform the nature of Vietnamese history, I think was really in many cases the fundamental problem that the United States faced in the war. And it was a problem that they never could solve, a problem for which perhaps there was no solution. So in many respects, I would argue that by about this point, by the early 1960s, certainly, in the aftermath of the Geneva Accords, the United States begins to march down a path in which the odds and possibility of success became more and more remote. One of the, one of the things I think which would be, become increasingly clear was that there was no clear military solution to that fundamental political problem. And that problem was one that would haunt the United States really throughout the rest of the war. Um, and at this point, I think, you really begin to see that, that die being cast and, and that challenge becoming increasingly clear. So at this point then, that combination of reformist ambition and lethal violence which comes to bear in, in Vietnam, really begins to snap into place. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop for today. The, the lecture that I'll do next time will actually talk about how the United States tries to invent a separate Vietnam, how the United States tries to put in place and ultimately come up with a strategy that would be both military and political to create a separate South Vietnam, and ultimately why this, why this does not succeed. Uh, why it does not unfold. And I'll focus most heavily on the Kennedy administration because I think it really sets in place a pattern which then is carried on to a larger degree for the rest of the war. But we have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here, and, and I'll be really delighted to, to respond to questions and, and see if I can uh, address anything that you're curious about that, that I went through here uh, today. Um, so, yes, sir? When was the period of stand-down when the North Vietnamese citizens were allowed to move south with aid, and the South Vietnamese uh, population was allowed to move north with aid. So the question was, when was this period of, of stand down when, when people were able to move about from different parts of the country? And, and it's, it's immediately after 1954. And so one of the things that you actually see at this point is a fairly broad movement of population. A number of, of anti-communists, a number of Vietnamese who had been aligned with the French, a number of Vietnamese who were, uh, uh, were closely aligned with Xi'an at the beginning of that government moved, a number of Catholics as well, a number of Vietnamese Catholics, moved from parts of northern Vietnam into the south, um, and, and ultimately moved farther to the south, knowing that that government would be created with the capital at Saigon. At that period then, immediately following 1954, um, a number of revolutionaries who had been fighting in the South did move into the North. Others deliberately stayed put because they anticipated that the possibility of an armed struggle would go forward. And so a number of the Viet Minh who had formerly fought against the French expected that the likelihood of violence continuing was high and, and stayed secretly in Southern Vietnam at that point. More move south than move north. Yeah, yeah. It's a big, it's a big part of it. Yeah. Uh, Eric, I'll try to ask this concisely. Uh, in, in the beginning, you described how Truman splits it. It says you're either this or this, and I very clearly understand it's not just ideological, it, communism versus non-communism, but that we're talking about totalitarianism and the specter of the oppression that came with this, and what happened to Eastern Europe, 
under Stalinism. Right. And then I also recognized the, the irony that that's what Zim was bringing to southern Vietnam. Um, and so the big question I have is, was Ho a totalitarian? Did he show tendencies toward that kind of oppression and violence that Zim did, that Stalin did, that obviously his mentors were? Yeah. That's, that's a really important question. So the question is, you know, when you think about this point where Truman is talking about the, the, the bipolar nature of the world and, and every nation must choose between alternative ways of life, but to some extent, the, the question then emerges, well, what, what about people like Ho Chi Minh? How, how should we think about Ho? How should we think about, uh, I mean, there's great irony is, 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 is pointed out that the government the United States supports in South Vietnam is in no way democratic. I mean, this is this is a, a, a quite brutal dictatorship. Um, what about Ho Chi Minh himself? Where where how do we think about him? It's actually a really important question. Um, uh, what you begin to see in North Vietnam after 1954, in some respects, can, certainly could be described as repressive. Uh, large numbers of landlords were stripped of their land. Uh, a number were jailed and imprisoned. Uh, there was a process of land reform that moved forward pretty aggressively. Um, in fact, uh, there was a network of prison camps, which a number of uh, uh, anti-government landlords found themselves in. Uh, there were also cases where political opponents were wiped out, uh, were jailed, imprisoned, sometimes executed. So we, we certainly don't want to make the mistake of, of thinking somehow that, that Ho Chi Minh himself was a perfect Democrat. <laughs> Uh, because he wasn't, you know, by, by no means. Um, uh, one of the big questions that emerges, I think, however, is what would a united government under his authority have looked like geopolitically in relation to the United States? Would it have been, as, as Truman feared, a Soviet satellite or, or a kind of Chinese puppet? And I think there's a lot of reason to believe that was, that was not the case. I think there's a lot of reason to believe that the domino theory itself, that conceptual model, was deeply flawed. I mean, it's interesting. One of the primary opponents, I mean, one of the arguments against the war and the intervention that challenged the credibility idea was, was this. So, where some policymakers were saying, look, we don't have a choice. Either we engage in Vietnam and fight communism there, or our credibility is going to suffer. Allies around the world will say, look, the United States didn't engage. They'll lose faith and sense, a sense that the U.S. will support them. They'll lose confidence in the ability or willingness of the U.S. to defend them. The Soviets and the Chinese, for their part, will say, hey, the Americans don't have any resolve. Let's hit the accelerator. Let's go ahead and do what we can do to expand wherever we can. The counter-argument to that, however, which was increasingly made by the mid-60s, was... You, are you really worried about your credibility being damaged? Well, one way to really damage your credibility is to go to war there and lose. And to lose, lose in a powerful way. That will do real damage to your credibility. So, this idea of thinking about and, and sort of envisioning the strategic stakes of the war, I think is a really important one. Part of it, I think, does come into these questions of values. Part of it does come into these questions. And Truman, of course, is used in the language of, of values. He's talking about freedom. He's talking about independence. He's talking about self-determination. He's, he's talking about a vision of what a world emerging from the ashes of World War II should look like. After all, we just defeated the Nazis. We defeated totalitarianism. We defeated Imperial Japan. Here's a moment where something might be profoundly different. And he's using that kind of language. And yet at the same time, one of the great ironies is that in seeking to defend against what Americans perceive as a pattern of communist aggression, we wind up aligning ourselves with dictators like no is um, one, of the, one of the most really brilliantly written books about the American relationship with dictatorship during the Cold War is titled, Thank God They're on Our Side. <laughs> Um, a sense that, you know, you really don't want to get into the gutter with these people. Um, and, and yet, that's one of the great ironies of the war. Um, yes, sir? A little off the topic, but sort of under topic. Uh, when there is a war, and specifically when the U.S. goes to war anywhere, <clears throat> it seems like sometimes we're fighting an individual. And 
once that individual falls, whether it's a Stalin or a Mussolini or a Hirohito or, you know, the ideology kind of falls apart and the war ends. But then there's wars like Vietnam or maybe Al Qaeda or radical Islam or whatever you want to call it. It's an ideology. It's not driven by one man or one particular geographic area. Uh, can you kind of talk about winning a war against an ideology versus against a uh, an individual? Yeah, it's, it's a really it's a really interesting question. It's sort of the, the question had to do with the idea that um, in some cases you the United States would go to war against um, uh, a person who was a very powerful political figure, whether it's uh, Hitler or Mussolini or Hirohito, which are which are really sort of people who have to some extent uh, a degree of control and, and nature of a regime that once those people are destroyed, that 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 at, that ultimately that regime itself also loses all momentum. And thinking about that in, in the context of, of the Vietnamese Revolution. You know, one of the interesting things here is that, that Ho Chi Minh is, is dead before the 1960s are over. Um, you know, he was already 50 years old by the time he returned to Vietnam. Um, uh, uh, he, he, he had passed away, I think it was 1969. 68 or 69, I think it was 69 uh, when, he, when he dies. Uh, and of course, the war continues to gather momentum. And in the face of some of the very heaviest bombing that the United States does in the course of the entire war, the revolutionaries just keep on going. And so I, I think that in many respects, while Ho was probably the most highly visible and most articulate and uh, in many ways, I think a key architect for the beginnings of, of, of the revolution. The ideology which was driving that revolution was so deeply rooted, I would argue, in the experience of French imperialism, in the long struggle against foreign domination, that it had really, in many respects, permeated the revolutionary movement itself. And, and I think it's part of the reason that, that even as Ho begins to lose power, and actually politically, even before his death, Ho was marginalized politically, I would say by 65 or so. He is maybe even a little bit earlier stepping back from a lot of the direct political control. He, uh, even Ziap is, is being forced out. There are actually people within the revolution who are taking a harder line than they are. Uh, Le Zouan is probably the most important of them, uh, coming into political power. Um, but the revolution, in fact, was so deeply rooted that it was really gathering its own momentum and continued to do so through that point. Um, yes? Um, I grew up in the Philippines, and I remember um, seeing a newspaper article when Nong Dinh Diem was assassinated. Yeah. And, and, you know, talking about it in the household, and my mother commented the CIA had him killed. Is that, is that historically born, or revolutionaries maybe um, did it? Well, it's, it's a good question. I think the question had to do with the, the death of Xi'an. Uh, and and Xi'an actually dies uh, in a coup attempt in, in 1963. Um, and, and, and I think that, what we, and I'll talk more about this next time that we meet, actually. Xi'an's ability to hold power became more and more tenuous by the early 1960s. And, and the degree of opposition to him began to build uh, public demonstrations, in fact, very large Buddhist religious demonstrations and protest against his government began to build. Uh, and there was a great deal of concern on the part of the Kennedy administration, a great deal of worry that, that you know, maybe we've got the wrong guy. Uh, but one of the alternatives, is there a better solution? Is there somebody else we could work with? And there was a lot of back and forth about this. And uh, in the fall of 1963, a group of generals who were determined to overthrow Xi'an, South Vietnamese generals, who wanted to overthrow Xi'an and seek power themselves, approached the US government. They approached the US ambassador, and they approached the State Department. And they said, if we overthrow Xi'an, what's your response going to be? And ultimately, the response that came back from the United States was, uh, we're not going to stop you. Um, they didn't promise to assist, but they said, we're not going to stop you. And at that point, the coup did go forward, and, and Xi'an was actually shot to death along with his brother, Nu, in the back of an armored personnel carrier in Saigon in, in the fall of 1963. Um, I don't think there's any 
clear evidence that the Central Intelligence Agency did that. I think that was probably his, his South Vietnamese political opponents, uh, who not only did they want to have a coup, they didn't want to have him available for trial. They didn't want him to remain as a source of potential political opposition. They were going to take him out of the picture altogether. And that was actually the beginning, though, of a series of coups. There would be one coup after another within the South Vietnamese government from that point forward, which only magnified this problem that the U.S. faced in trying to find some sort of a government that would have stability and legitimacy. After the Second World War, we were instrumental in, in, in promoting the United Nations. And the United Nations was involved in these negotiations in 54. What does our rejection of having a vote for the whole country say about our support for democracy? Yeah. yeah, so the question had to do with, well, the fact that you know, the U.S. was instrumental in creating the U.N. and supporting the U.N. in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, and here is a, a, a diplomatic agreement, uh, and it includes the provision for elections. And so what does the American rejection of those elections suggest about the depth of American commitment to democracy? Yeah. And, and I think that's a really important question. I think in many respects, uh, what you see consistently in the 1950s is an American unwillingness to accept democracy if it runs the risk of a significantly adverse political result. Uh, I think you could see that in a number of places. Uh, you could see it in, in this case, in 1954, in the decision to, to violate the Geneva Accords. Uh, I would suggest you could see it in the coup the United States launches in 1954 in Guatemala, where they overthrow the government of Jacobo Arbenz. Uh, I would say it's probably also in the way the U.S. and the British support the end of the government of Mossadegh in Iran, putting in place the Shah. Uh, you can find case after case where the American commitment to democracy is, is in many ways a much more expedient one. Um, uh, there are a number of, of cases where rather than allowing the democracy to go forward, given the risk that would pose, the U.S. chooses a different alternative. And that's one of the tragedies of the Cold War, I would say. It's one of the tragedies of the, the perceptual framework which begins to lock in place so firmly uh, as, as the Cold War accelerates. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that the Cold War accelerated from uh, the success that was happening in the Philippines, where those people were, put that, were able to put down the hook rebellion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we then thought that we could do the same thing when we would intervene in Vietnam. It's a good point. Yeah, so the, the question says, well, what about what happened in the Philippines as, as the United States began to, to intervene there? Uh, the Filipino government uh, uh, successfully put down a rebellion, uh, a, a left-wing rebellion there. Was there a sense that the same thing could be done in Vietnam? And your point is absolutely right. A lot of American strategic thinkers uh, when they looked at South Vietnam, they tried to think about the Philippines as a model. Can our counterinsurgency strategy, which we'll develop and deploy, and I'll talk much more about this next time, can our counterinsurgency strategy emulate ones that were successful elsewhere? In the Philippines or, or in Malaya, for example, where the British government uh, had supported an insurgency. And so there was, there was a sense that that, that could be replicated. Um, and ultimately that would prove to be, to be wrong. Uh, but but that was that was part of the American thinking at this point. Your questions on the mark. Well, the uh, they, first thing they did was to send Ed Lansdale to That's correct. Vietnam. That's correct. Yep. Uh, Edmund Lansdale was an American political intelligence officer who was deeply involved in, in defeating the revolution in the Philippines, and they thought that he then could try to work that same that same solution in Vietnam. And we'll talk about why why they didn't. Um, any last questions? We're just about out of time. Okay, I look forward to seeing you all. I hope you Thank you. Thank you very much. Before you leave, remember to turn on your phones and turn off your T-coils, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.